Thank you for joining me today for Garden Tools. I love gardening and exploring new possibilities for effective gardening. Whether you're an experienced gardener or just want to make the most of your green th thumb, the right garden tool makes tending your garden more enjoyable. Join me to learn more about the right tools for the job and tool maintenance tips. We'll also dive into some basic ergonomics to enable gardeners to keep feeling good and out in the garden. Today's webinar will explore how gardening with the right tool can help us be more effective with our tasks. That means we will identify how different tools help us with our cultural practices in the garden. Some discussion will explore how the materials and construction of a tool affect the tool's overall life and efficiency in the garden. We'll learn how regular tool maintenance keeps our tools clean, sharp, and prolongs their life. We will also look into ergonomics and evaluate the tools and the good habits that will help keep us healthy and out in the garden. Historically, humans advanced to use the resources available for them to grow crops. It was a gradual process. Tools and gardening techniques were developed to help them be more effective. Artifacts, paintings, and archaeological digs sites provide evidence of human history and the progress of agriculture. Some of the tools, such as rakes, sickles, or even buckets, haven't changed all that much. But from Neolithic digging sticks to Roman metal sickles to complex irrigation, humans toiled to grow food for their families and civilization. If you think about it, that same process from seed to supper follows a similar path today. So what needs to happen before you get to harvest? Well, it's an ongoing cycle. Today, we're going to look at the tools that help us to plan, dig, plant, water, cut, maintain, and so on. Whether growing <clears throat> vegetable crops or flowers, you will want to develop the right plan and bring the right tools. The photos on the right and left of this page show an in-ground garden. In the middle are raised beds. How might the size and shape of the tools for the raised beds versus the in-ground beds differ? For example, I grow vegetables for my family in a raised bed at the community garden. And I volunteer and grow vegetables at Grow an Extra Row Learning and Giving Garden. Last year, our master gardeners and community volunteers delivered over 2,000 pounds of fresh vegetables to the food banks for our community members with food insecurity. As you can imagine, the scope of the work and the tools differs greatly between these two gardens. Making a decision on what tools you purchase will depend on your gardening space, your budget, and perhaps your expertise. Master gardeners have their favorite tools that they use regularly regardless. OSU generally recommends that you shop for quality rather than quantity when purchasing garden tools. Quality tools will last a long time and are worth the initial investment and expense. Metal parts should be made of steel or hardened aluminum. These materials stay sharp, keep their shape, and outlast tools that are made out of softer metals. If gardening in containers, you might be able to get away with just a trowel, pruner, a cultivator, and some gloves for your prepping, planting, and maintaining. In a raised bed, hand tools or short handled shovels, forks, and hoes are easiest to maneuver, like the ones in the photo on the left. If the bed is 30 inches or higher, long handled tools get a little awkward. A cult, however, a cultivator with a long handle and maybe a watering wand are still very good for raised beds because they'll reach the middle for weeding and allow for lots of ergonomic um, bending 
or lack of bending. Generally, raised beds have been filled with a combination of native soil and a good quality commercial raised bed soil, which gives it a lighter, fluffier texture, so the tool need not be too robust. And in the ground garden, whether at home or at a community garden, entails using heftier tools. Tools with longer handles offer better leverage when working compacted or clay type soils. It also means getting down on your hands and knees for planting, harvesting, or maintaining. A kneeling pad is an easy fix for sore or wet knees. Lastly, with an in-ground garden, you are looking at higher volumes of tools, weeds, and hopefully harvests. So a wheelbarrow or a garden cart are also useful. Now let's look at the specific tools that are helpful for digging, planting, watering, cutting, and maintaining. Be sure to wear the lens for your particular gardening space. Forks, spades, and shovels represent the holy trinity of must-have digging tools for gardeners. When buying them, it's important to purchase the high-quality products. These tools are likely to be used on a daily basis. While many people use the terms spade and shovel interchangeably, they are technically two different tools. Spades look similar to shovels, but they tend to have a shorter shaft and a flat rectangular blade. They slice into dirt and scoop up soil and other gardening materials very well. They also perform any of the gardening tasks that requires a nice straight edge. When it comes to digging, shovels are an invaluable gardening tool and should be one of your first. Compared to other digging tools, shovels have a longer shaft and allow gardeners to work comfortably from a standing position. Shovel blades tend to have an angular tip and a curved concave shape for scooping materials. The pointed and curved blade makes shovels a go-to for digging holes and breaking up soil. There are specialized shovels and spades that have been developed to help with slicing through roots or digging in tight spaces. Think about borrowing one of these specialized tools as a solution in lieu of another expense or tool in your tool shed. The unsung hero, the common garden trowel, represents one of the most versatile items in a gardener's toolbox, another one that you'll want to get right off the bat. Trowels are needed for everything from digging small holes for seeds, removing weeds, and digging up small plants, or digging holes for perennials, and also for potting plants. When choosing garden trowels, Look for a good solid handle, steel blades, and if you can find it with an ergonomic hand grip. Garden forks help turn the soil and dig out root crops. The larger version, the broad fork, is a game changer when it comes to working 8,400 square feet of soil at Grow an Extra Row. We use the broad fork in the spring to loosen soil in preparation for planting digging up potatoes in the summer, and in the fall to loosen and remove plants as we button up the 42 vegetable beds. Both the garden fork and the broad fork are beneficial since their digging action preserves the soil structure while creating an optimum growing environment for root development, efficient well-draining soil, and the integration of soil amendments. The garden fork is one of those you want to get right at the beginning of gardening. The root slayer was a very popular spade for master gardeners. So if you have a lot of tough soil or roots, maybe that's a tool you need. The garden fork, always a standby for every gardener. You can use it so many different ways. Once the soil has been prepared, here are some helpful tips for, 
are helpful tools for planting. Shovels, rakes, and the hand trowel are must-haves for the planting season. But all the tools pictured here are valuable for tasks that they are designed for. A dibbler with a depth guide can make fast work of preparation for planting seeds, poking holes just at the right depth. At Grow an Extra Row, we have found the post hole shovel great for digging deep holes for potatoes or tomatoes. The auger will also make fast work of digging a nice deep hole in tough soil. It can also dig hundreds of holes if you're planting a large bed of bulbs. The bulb planting tool with the long handle keeps you off your knees and with the step plate gives your wrists and hands a break from digging. It produces efficient holes at the appropriate depth and then releases a plug of soil to cover the bulb. Here are some of the Master Gardener's favorite planting tools. The floral shovel. This is a shovel that is a little narrower and it helps you dig nice, efficient holes. No surprise there, the ground, the hand trowel is very, very popular and, carry, and it's carried everywhere by master gardeners. And the hoary hoary knife. Do you have one of those in your tool bags? It's perfect for planting. You can stab the soil, you pull it towards you, and it makes a nice hole. It also usually has some sort of measuring device along the edge so that you know your hole is going to be the right depth. Establishing a water system that works for you is important for your plants, whether it be for flowers or vegetables. All of the watering options pictured here above are recommended by OSU. Your choice will depend on your water source, your budget, and your expertise. From a watering can to drip irrigation, the most important thing you can do for your garden is to deliver consistent deep watering sessions. Access to a spigot allows for all of these pictured above. A watering wand with a long handle, like the one my granddaughter is using with the red shirt, has a little breaker head on it, and that delivers a lot of, lot of water with a uniform flow. Soaker hoses attached to a timer is an easy and inexpensive method for an irrigation system. It's not permanent, so it's perfect solution for a community garden. I use garden sakes to keep that hose secured. A lot of people forget about this, but hose washers are essential for preventing dripping faucets, hoses, and watering wands. Replacing them in the beginning of the season will save a lot of frustration, water, and water dripping down to your elbows. <laughs> As for drip irrigation, there are lots of dis different systems that can be installed with timers. The master gardeners appreciate a watering can, especially if it has an extra long neck on it. Also, drip irrigation is a popular method for watering. Here are a variety of fine cutting tools from the bypass pruners to loppers to saws and even that little tiny garden snip, they all have a job. The bypass pruner is a standby for every gardener, whether you are into vegetables or flowers or just tidying an unruly branch on a shrub. What is key is that your pruner fits your hand. Yes, they come in different sizes. So the pruner that you share with your husband may not be optimum in terms of fit or ergonomics. Therefore, if you're going to replace your pruners or you're buying your first set, it might be worth your while to go to a quality garden shop where they have a nice array and try them on. What feels comfortable? Lastly, 
Scissors can often get the job done for deadheading or lightweight harvesting. And I like to share my garden with eager children, like my granddaughter Emma in the little blue bonnet. I allow her to prune and trim and harvest using scissors. Scissors are an excellent and safer tool for her to use. Here are some of the favorite cutting tool results from the Master Gardeners. Bypass pruners, they should be one of the firsts in your toolbox. And loppers, they give you the opportunity to get um, tougher branches up to two inches. And then the pruning handsaw, it cuts branches wider and um, some of them even fold shut so you can transport them easily. Weeding, cultivating, pest management, and trimming are the most important maintenance tasks in the garden. A small, well-maintained garden will outproduce a large garden that has gotten out of hand. A long-handled mechanical weeder, as shown here, is very effective at removing weeds from an in-ground garden or in the lawn. When shopping for a weeder, whether it is handheld or this mechanical weed remover, always look for sturdy metal parts. Hose weed and cultivate. The scuffle hoe cuts young weeds right below the surface and disrupts new emerging weeds. Whereas a garden hoe can chop more established weeds. And then the hoary hoary knife just does it all. If you have it at your side, you can get the weeds out with it. Shrub rakes are different in that the fan area is only around 12 inches across, allowing you to get around plants or shrubs, as the name suggests. Being present and making observations is one of the best ways to stay ahead of pests. At Grow an Extra Row, there are so many crops, we added a lot of preventive pest management measures to maintain vegetable production. Tool cloth is a barrier for flying insects, and this fabric was just purchased from a fabric store. The color doesn't matter. The yellow sticky trap catch flying insects and let you know who's been in the garden, so you know how to do some abatement. The copper ring here is a wonderful barrier that discourages slugs from feasting on young broccoli seedlings. Here are some of our master gardeners' favorites for maintaining. The shrub rake, the scuffle hoe, and once again, they use the hoary hoary knife during their maintenance chores. Gardening gloves keep your hands protected and clean while gardening and can help prevent painful blisters and cuts. They come in all the types of fabrics, all the colors. I keep both a tight fitting pair of gloves that have rubber fingertips for good gripping. And I also have a nice pair of leather gloves for heavy duty digging. In the spring, I love my insulated gloves for early for early spring gardening when it's cold and wet. They're waterproof and they keep my hands warm. Wheelbarrows have sloped sides and a single front wheel, indispensable for hauling around huge tomato harvests. Soil, compost, plants, debris, pools, and perhaps even a lawn ornament. They are fairly easy to maneuver, but can be a little tricky due to the single front wheel. If that's your case, it's gotten a little tricky, perhaps a wagon or a cart will be safer and easier. Garden carts have straight sides and two or more wheels, which makes them more stable than a wheelbarrow. However, 
They are not for heavy loads. You can also use a tub or a floral bucket as a tool carrier to keep your small tools together. I like to nest two tubs together when going to the community garden. The top one holds my hand tools, and then I pull the bottom one out for when I'm pulling weeds, I toss them in the tub, and then at the end of the day, I can transport all my harvests home. Planning your garden is very, very important, and there are plenty of garden planting apps available. Some are free on seed catalog websites. What's nice is that you can plot out the size of the garden and the app helps you with calculations for how many plants belong in each area. This could also be done manually with your gardening journal. Those are important accessories. The soil thermometers are very, very critical. Seeds need to be planted at the optimum soil temperature. Too cold and your seeds will just rot. This last item is called a garden glider and is an interesting newer transport for, the he for heavy or very awkward loads. And the benefit is that you don't have to lift that plant very high to get it on the glider. Therefore, hopefully you're gonna keep that root ball all together. The smooth bottom prevents friction. I thought it looked pretty cool. Here are some of the Master Gardener's favorite picks. Gardening gloves, they each had their favorite to share. And the soil thermometer. Remember, we want germination. We want those seeds to pop. So be sure to use your soil thermometer. It's an important accessory. Easily overlooked when building up your gardening equipment arsenal as your safety equipment, and they will represent some of your most important purchases. Gloves should be your first purchase. A good pair of gardening gloves will protect your hands and your arms from everything from small scrapes to splinters or larger flesh wounds. Sun protection is another important safety accessory, whether it be a hat, long sleeves, sunglasses, or sunscreen. Your ears and eyes deserve protection from loud sounds, falling debris, or small metal fragments when sharpening tools. Plan ahead when it comes to safety. I've seen quite a few friends wear gloves like this. And I like to wear long sleeves, especially if I'm gonna be picking cucumbers. Those prickles really bother me at the end of the day. And think about getting a sheath for some of your favorite tools. You can have those tools handy at your belt and they can be kept safe and sound instead of getting stuck underneath a leaf and lost. Again, your budget will ultimately guide your purchases. And Jim Fox, author and experienced gardener, advises buy good quality tools and then take care of them. He also states, Use a tool for what it's made for. So if you need a pry bar, then buy a pry bar or borrow a pry bar to dig up those stubborn roots, not your garden fork or your shovel. Fox regularly uses long handled tools such as shovels, rakes, hose and spades. Good quality tools will have a 14 gauge metal or better and have a nice long shank to provide strength to the tool at its highest stress point. Solid cast or one piece of metal, not a lot of soldering joints that will bend and break. And for heavy duty jobs, you will need a heavy duty shovel. So one made from solid steel is gonna be best. If the whole shovel is made from one solid material, then it won't snap at the collar point as this is the weakest point of most shovels and the cause of most breakages. If your shovel is going to be used for lighter work, 
such as scooping or just moving a little soil, then you can go with an aluminum shovel. That would be a good choice because it weighs less and it's relatively sturdy. Sturdy wood, such as hickory or ash, will last when well cared for. And usually the wood is labeled if it is a nice hardwood. Fiberglass handles are fine. Many premium shovels are now made from titanium, titanium, which has the benefit of being lightweight and also exceptionally sturdy, even more sturdy than steel. Titanium is also resistant to rust and will also not corrode, resulting in a long lasting shovel. Titanium shovels do come with a big price tag. My last bit of advice in order to get a long life from your tool is label it. When I work with a group of master gardeners, I'm happy to share my tools, but I want to get them back at the end of the day. So each of us has our own signature colorful duct tape tape on every tool. Can you see what mine is? It's the red buffalo plaid. Again, your budget will ultimately guide your purchase, but Jim Fox advises not to skimp, especially with your hand pruners, loppers and pruning saws. They help to keep your shrubs and trees shapely and proportioned by good quality tools and then take care of them. That's what he says. Also use the tool for what it's made for. He mentions that hand pruners are great for deadheading flowers, harvesting vegetables, and cutting small twigs. And you may have the strength to cut through a branch greater than a half an inch, but you risk twisting the blades out of alignment. They weren't made for big, heavy duty cuts. Fox and others prefer the bypass style of pruners versus the anvil, which comes down more like a guillotine. The longer length on hand on uh, for loppers, the longer length on the handles provides a mechanical advantage for cutting branches up to two inches. Metal or fiberglass handles make them very durable and now preferable over wooden handles. Pruning saws are used for cutting larger limbs more than two inches in diameter. I like the way my hand saw folds back into its handle and it's easy for me to carry and to store safely. These saws come in a variety of sizes with extensions that allow you to prune high into the tree. Fox recommends that pruning saws be professionally sharpened unless you are very experienced. A sharp tool will shorten the amount of time you spend working and prolong the tool's useful life. Neglected tools like these on the left won't be effective for the tasks that they were designed for. The clippers I owned served my father for over 30 years, and now I have a good 20 years of service in them. A little TLC and a tool may last two lifetimes. OSU recommends some common sense daily rich rituals that will keep your tools ready to do their job. During the growing season, always give your tools a good cleaning after a day's work. Clean them before you store them. Scrape off the soil. If you need, use a stiff wire brush. If there's rust, sandpaper can take care of that. Also, be sure to remove sap. You can use a solvent such as mineral spirits or a household foaming bathroom cleaner. Also a little steel wool will clean it up. For shovels, hose, forks, and other metal tools, you might want to have a bucket in your garage or your tool shed that has 
about four fifths full of sand and then some clean veg of clean engine oil or even vegetable oil, like the photo on the left. Then what you're going to do is you're going to plunge your tool in and out, in and out of the sand. That agitation is going to clean it up. Then wipe it down with a clean rag. Don't forget your wooden handles. They need to be cleaned as well. Get rid of that dirt. You can add a little linseed oil for your wooden handles. Here is a list of sharpening supplies. Depending on the type of tool, you may use some or all of these. The photo on the right shows a hoe being secured in a vise. You can see how the, um, the tool is being sharpened and the and it's um, you just go right along that edge. Garden tools work best when they are sharp. Hand cutting tools such as pruners, loppers, and hedge clippers are made of a soft steel and can be sharpened with a hand, sto hand stone, like the one in the photo on the right. Shovels, hoes, and cultivators are made of a harder steel and require a file, like we saw for, for the hoe. Here are two photos at the top of the page. The lopper is being held secure in the vise, and the sharpening stone is looks like it is removing some of the burrs from the back of that blade. You might not have a vise, and so you can secure your hoe by sitting on a bench and putting your knee on that handle and making it very secure. So steady that tool, and then you're going to set the sharpening angle. So what does that mean? You want to look at the angle that was set from the factory. That's what you want to follow. And you're going to take your file and take long, even strokes across the entire length of that metal surface, pushing away from yourself. Continue with that fluid stroking motion until you see a shiny edge start to develop. Continue until that's nice and even. If you're doing a shovel, you're going to start from the side of the shovel and work towards the point and do each side. Add finishing touches, like removing burrs from the opposite side of the edge. A final finishing touch might include a light machine oil, like a three-in-one oil, and also some lubrication for joints for coating the metal to protect it. I like to repurpose old t-shirts for my rags. One word of advice, if you're not familiar with sharpening your tools, don't always unassemble them. You don't want to take something apart that you may not know how to put back together. When the growing season is over, pay attention to the overall condition of each of your tools. So you'll again, you want to go through the cleaning process that we just went through. You can also follow up with that fine steel wool. Just make it nice and shiny. Be sure that all the rust is removed. Use a wire brush and or sandpaper. And when that blade is clean, you want to give this metal surface a nice coat of oil. That oil helps to reduce oxid oxidation, and that's what causes rust. Don't neglect the wooden handles. Please make sure that any rough spots are cleaned up by trimming them off and then sanding them smooth, and then put a nice heavy coat of linseed oil or even mineral oil on the handles.
When it's time to hang those tools up, please make sure you have a clean, dry storage space. Install whatever works for you, hooks, racks, brackets, and then hang the tools up. One word of caution, your wooden handles should not have contact with dirt. During winter storage, wooden handles having contact with dirt will encounter microbes that can damage and break down the wood over time. In gardening, ergonomics is the science of work. How people go about doing tasks with less stress and strain on joints and muscles. Who in these pictures is showing good ergonomics? Nope. Kneeling on both knees and supporting yourself with one hand is bad form. It puts strain on your back, arms, and wrist. Nope. Leaning over the hoe is bad posture. It puts strain on the shoulders and back. Nope. Folding your body over with your bottom high and your legs straight is bad form. This stresses out your back and the hamstring muscles. The woman in the blue t-shirt has a specialized longer handled hoe with an ergonomic handle. Her posture is good too. Her legs are spaced apart for good balance and weight distribution over the center of her body. Picking the right tools and posture is the prescription for good ergonomics. So the very first step in order to make wise ergonomic decisions and adaptations is to take time to make an honest self-assessment of your physical abilities, the environment you are going to be gardening in, and what type of garden you want to have. You want to focus on choosing the right tools for the tasks, a tool that's comfortable, long handles that fit well, ones that are comfortable and natural to use and feel good in use and after. You might need lighter weight tools. You might need a tool design that provides a mechanical advantage. And as always, a gardener needs to maintain good posture. Listen to a committed gardener and you will, in a few minutes, you'll he probably hear something about aches and pains. When common complaints led these common complaints led to the happy collision of engineering and horticulture and the birth of ergonomic tools. They provide some more comfort and pre precision and less effort needed if held in the correct position. Now, lots of companies claim to provide ergonomic tools with marketing and packaging, but beware, not all tools are created equally. What is the science behind their design? Be sure to do your research and try the tool out and listen to your body. Here are a nice set of ergonomic tools. An ergonomic shovel has a curved shaft and that provides some mechanical advantage. Here are hand modified hand tools and that wider hand gives a, a better grip for uh, folks. This Hand pruner has a handle that rotates and is quite comfortable for some gardeners. A pruner with a ratchet provides an a, a mechanical advantage. So does the geared lopper. Here's a cultivator that has been modified by the gardener, adding some foam around the, the handle and some tape provided a larger handle that's, that is padded and allows the gardener to continue working in their garden. This reinforced garden trowel has a modified handle that provides stability for your arm, wrist, and hand. Keeps everything in a nice neutral position. This is what we call a nice neutral position. And then ergonomic handles have been added to cultivators, hoes, and shovels, and they help to balance the load and ease the task. What are some of the my master gardener's favorites. 
Yes, hand tools that have modified handles really help in a long stay's work. And any of the pruners that have ratcheting provide that mechanical advantage and make it easier to pull on the handle. Here are a few good ergonomic body positions that are easy to incorporate into your gardening routine. Number one, by using a split stance, kneeling on one knee and the other leg out in front allows you to work with a straight back and takes pressure off your arms. Number two, the ergonomic shovel provides comfortable, a comfortable handle and modified handle helps to keep your body in that neutral position. Bent knees provides good balance for your body during the work. Number three, the garden stools prevent fatigue and relief of strain on your knees, feet, and hips. A good upright position prevents strain on the back and the shoulders. Remember, if you start leaning, you might have to use move that garden stool. And then number four, you may have heard the phrase, lift with your legs. How does this statement relate to ergonomic body positions? Well, bent knees provide a good position for the leg and your buttocks muscles to lift that watering can. The load is centered under the center of the body and the back is in a neutral position. By the way, if lifting a full watering can is too much for you, then fill it halfway. Information available from the U.S. Consumer Product Safety Commission indicates there are more than 26,000 people who are treated in hospitals yearly for injuries sustained while using garden tools. Typical injuries are strains, sprains to the lower back, shoulder, neck, and wrist. Many of these injuries could have been prevented by properly using the garden tools and by knowing your physical capabilities and keeping garden activities to within your limitations. This self-awareness is the foundation to safety, injury prevention, and good ergonomics. Keeping your body position in that neutral position that doesn't strain joints is optimum. Using the best tool for the task is also important. Take a look at the two gardeners in the photos. The woman in this photo on the left shows she is in a split stance, wearing her gloves and using a hammer to align the garden border. Good self-awareness with her starting point. This woman on the photo on the right is using an ergonomic tool and is keeping her body in a neutral position. When standard tools are leaving you sore or injured, it may be time to either pass that task on to someone else or experiment with ergonomic tools. Occupational therapists are often a good starting point. Some activities that can increase your risk for repet are, are for repetitive strain injury or RSI. Stressing the same muscles through repetition, maintaining the same posture for long periods of time, maintaining an abnormal or awkward posture for an extended period of time, and just lifting really heavy objects. These move movements can cause your muscles and tendons to become damaged over time. Prevention is the way to go. And if you look here, just alternate your gardening task. That's an easy little tweak in your routine. Weed a little bit, water, harvest, maybe water again, weed a little bit more, and then get those final harvests into your tub to go home. Just alternate these things. The other thing that's really important is just avoid fatigue. Sometimes we don't let ourselves sit down and take a break. It's very important for prevention of injury. Occupational therapists acknowledge that gardening is very physical and therefore requires prevent preventive measures. Recommendations are to start with a light warm up, such as a two to three minute walk to get the blood flowing, then stretching before and after gardening. For big tasks in the garden, ask for help. 
Working as a team spreads the physical exertion around. Lots of happy chatter at a work party in the garden is good for your mind, body, and soul. If you want to learn more about this topic of ergonomics on June 12th, our series Let's Grow Together has a detailed webinar called The Enabled Gardener. So let's review. It's important that we pick the right tools to help us to be effective with our gardening tax, tasks. We need to use clean and sharp tools and that optimizes our work efforts in the garden. And let's remember that ergonomics is the science of work, how people go about doing tasks with less stress and strain on the joints and muscles in the garden. Here is a list of some of the resources used to put this webinar together. Additional resources. and even a few books. And our Q&A will begin next. Thank you for attending today's webinar. Remember tomorrow's webinar will be Growing Cane Berries. Register and tune in. And also I wanted to bring to your attention that the Clackamas Master Gardener Association presents Garden Discovery Day on March 9th. Come and enjoy classes, free pH soil testing, educational displays, and more. It's all free and in person. The link below will give you all the details. That was a terrific presentation, Priscilla. And uh, I particularly enjoy all of the little tips and tricks you've gotten from being part of the Grow and Extra Row community. Um, that's really fun. Um, so. We did get some really good questions and actually some great garden tips from other gardeners. So let's I love get it. started. Um, the first question we got before it even started was, I need a tool to get into the cracks between like paving stones and asphalt and stuff. Is there something that you have that you recommend or? Well, if you want to do mechanical, uh, removal, of course, you can use the corner of a hoe, then you if it's a long handled hoe, you don't have to get down on your hands and knees. They also have a very specialized tool. I, I bet you it's called a weed remover, but it's kind of a little wedge, and it will scrape in between. Do you have any yeah. ideas, Leah? Well, I, actually, I did not. But one of the things I did when I was talking about promoting this website was asking people, what's your favorite tool on Facebook? And um, one of the gals said, oh, I, I love my snakehead hoe. And I thought, well, that sounds scary. So I looked it up and there is actually, it's a kind of a snakehead, you know, very thin kind of cobra looking thing um, that people that you can use for that. And then there's, there's other special, like you mentioned, um, hoes that come to a really sharp point. And they're very narrow. And it's, I think it's called an asphalt crack hole or something like that. But they come, they come in both short and long handle, which, you know, again, is great for the ergonomics that you're talking about. So yeah. um, another good question we have was there was a gardener, um, and I so related to this in starting gardening many years ago, and it's getting a tool and go, okay, how do I use this and when? And she has gotten a scuffle hole and doesn't quite know when and how to use it. So maybe you could share some something on that. Well, the scuffle hoe is something that we do use over at Grow an Extra Row. I actually don't have one because I don't really need it for my community garden. But basically, you're going to hold the hoe in the same position as you would a regular hoe. And you want the, it, it's, shape, it's shaped like a, a stirrup. And so you want that bottom edge to be sharp. So that's a, an edge that you need to sharpen. And you just run it back and forth, back and forth. Um, and what it does is it just knocks out those young weeds and also the emerging ones. While you're doing it, it's kind of cultivating the, the soil as well. But it's good to use in between your vegetable rows. It's good to use on the edge of your flower beds. Anywhere 
weeds are going to be emerging and um, it usually has a long handle and so it keeps you upright just mind your posture as you're doing it don't they i think they typically work better on soil that is you know fairly light like true if i'm using using on the clay soil that i have a lot of it's kind of it's not the best but for okay. any anything that's been that's been worked at all like you said I, it's it's terrific yes um, back to the uh just we just got a, a thing in q a about tools for hoeing in cracks and somebody said a cape cod hoe is a good thing never heard of it but just passing that information on um some of the the grow and extra row tips that you had i just want to go over some of those um i love the tool idea i heard i we talked about it last year and i haven't had a chance to um to use that but i thought that was just a really great way you know you could get it if you can find it on sale you could get yards and yards of it for not very much money and uh right could make and colorful. I think the quality that we buy is the superior quality. The yeah. tool comes in lots of different, you know, it's it's like bridal veil material. Mm -hmm. So if it has large holes, it is not going to keep the white flies off your broccoli. Um, so you want to get a good quality of tool. Color doesn't matter. Um, one important point with tool is you do not want to cover any of your vegetable plants that are going to need pollination because mm. it is going to keep your pollinators out of the garden. So just be aware of that. You don't want to put it on your tomatoes. You don't want to put it on your squash because <laughs> otherwise you're not going to get anything fruiting very well. Good point. Thank you very much for that tip. Uh, another thing that you talked about was putting tape on your garden tools. Yes. And one of the things, my favorite is the Hori Hori that I just found out about like five years ago when it was given to me as a gift. And I thought, this is wonderful. Um, but my favorite one has like a walnut handle and which is dirt colored. And I get distracted when I garden and I have, you know, it just kind of, I wander away and then I can never find it. I probably have nine or ten hori hori is hidden in my garden somewhere um but your your tip of of using the the tape was great and then another uh one of our uh, attendees said he uses reflective bicycle tape on his tools which i think would was a great idea uh to help make it show up even a little bit better so yeah so you it's could not go only... hunting at the night with a flashlight yes. <laughs> Wow. I had to do that actually, but that, that, that he also suggested um, this was Mitch. Thank you, Mitch. Um, that in allergy season, wearing a mask is a really great help. And after COVID, I'm sure many people have lots of those hanging around the house. So that's something good. Um, one of the really um, interesting questions, and you talked about this a little bit with the ergonomics. But it's how do you work on your hands? You know, a lot of gardening tasks, you have to be on your hands and knees. And how do you, you know, what's the best way to do that? Um, I know you talked a little bit about garden cart, um, you know, the, the stools that kind of you can sit and, and work, but um, you want to go into that a little bit more or? Um, sure. So um, getting down on two knees and then leaning forward with your hands is is really not a long term solution. So that split stance is really good. And you know that extended leg in the front, sometimes I have to extend that leg into the garden bed and just get a little bit closer. Uh, you can also um, use a tool that has more of a medium size length, you know, so you just modify instead of having a very short handle tool for your handiwork try and find ones that have a little bit longer ones or maybe even just modify the tools you have. Mm -hmm. um, um, what do you think? No, no, that's exactly it. Um, on my wish list is is um, one of those little carts with wheels that you can sit on and they've got a little bucket for your um, for your tools to go along with you. Um, but that only works in level flat spaces. Excuse me, I feel like I need to sneeze. Um, yeah, that wouldn't <laughs> be good on your that. hill. No. You're going to go for a ride. <laughs> yeah, really. Um, 
I, I would love to recommend to everybody, you put a link in your video uh, about, um, of, there's a video link on how to take care of your tools. I think it's from OSU. And I watched that uh, last night. Um, thank you for sharing that early with me. Um, but that was just a really great thing, you know, to go along with all of the information that, that, that you gave on taking how to take care of your tools. It's, it's miserable. That was a great thing. So, yeah, um, I think it's Garden Answers. And so it's going to be a YouTube link. And uh, I apologize if there's an ad that pops up, but that's the way it is. Um, but I thought that um, she's very short, succinct on cleaning and sharpening tools. And when you watch that video, you'll see the action that I was talking about moving across the metal in a nice fluid uh, motion. So important not to, you know, kind of um, be jagged about it. Otherwise, you can actually create ruts and, and create more problems in your tool than, than uh, fixing the, the, you know, sharpening them up. Um, yeah. Okay. Last question I have, we had a attendee who has Italian arum in her garden and she's asking for the best tool to get rid of that. Now, my daughter has Italian arum in her garden and she's saying, you know, uh, not my daughter, but the, the attendee, do I just dig it up or, you know, what's, is there something that, have you had experience with Italian arum? I have not. So um, I'm at a loss on this one. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> what do you, what <laughs> about you? I'll go into that a little bit more. Italian Aram has a lot of little tiny bulb bulblets. So you can dig it up, but if you don't get everything, you have to, um, it, it just comes back. And it's, I've asked Master Gardeners, I've asked OSU. And so if you have it, the best way to get rid of it from my research is that you dig up the bulb and then you dig up the soil around the bulb and you sift it uh, through a, you know, like a wire mesh kind of thing to get, to keep the bulbs out. So whoever asked that question, I'm sorry, I didn't get your name, but that's one of the, the research that I've heard. Um, we've tried all kinds of things. Yeah. You know what, I wasn't familiar with that term for it. I think that's that shiny green plant that kind of grows up, looks like it's going to be a lily and has white speckles. Is that the yes, stuff? Yes, that's yes, that's it. Yes, 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 absolutely yes. it. Yes, just digging out the plants or pulling them out is not going to do it. Um, I am trying to establish a new pollinator garden, and that is what is in there. So oh, I'm, I, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry. Lucky for me, I have Gus helping me. Yeah, yay, Gus. <laughs> so maybe we'll try that. <laughs> okay. Um, I think that's it. I wanted to thank you for um, me personally for showing the the bulb planting tool that you can stand up and use. Mm -hmm. um, I'm pretty excited about that. I didn't know about that. And I think yeah. that's one of the great things about being a gardener and there's always so much more that we can learn. And I yeah. just learned so much from your presentation today. It's just amazing. Great. Yeah. You just want you just need to look for those details. Make sure you get the one that has the little um, step on it so that you can use your legs yes. and yes. not try and push it down with, with yes. just your hands. Yes. Yeah. So if you had any questions that you didn't get answered today, make sure and send us an email in your video link and um, that you got with the, your video link. If you've got pictures, that's even better because that really helps us. Um, Anything else to add, Priscilla? Well, I just want to thank our gardening community out there for registering and tuning in and also sharing your tools and tips for, for gardening because that's how we all learn together. Thank you so much. All right. Have a great day.